Um, Colin Walters, so glad to be here this year. I love this conference. I love seeing a lot of familiar faces that I've seen before, people I've worked with online but never met in person, new faces. I love it. Working in free and open source software with all of you is just an amazing experience. I'd like to briefly say the other thing about why I do what I do, we just ended up making our society dependent on computers. And it's so important to keep them secure, up to date, and managed. You know, like, I have my retirement savings in my bank. They run Linux, right? We need to make sure that we keep these systems up to date and secure, and that's, that's why I'm here. Yeah, it's amazing to be here again. So many dev comps. This room has gotten smaller over time, um, which is an interesting side effect. This dev comp, what I was amazed by, is not only new stuff, which is really cool to see new ideas, um, but also how many people have pulled off things that have taken so long and are now actually being used all over the place, having a massive effect on the industry, on the community, on the world. That's amazing. I'm Dan. <laughs> so wait a second, wait a second. This talks about booting a container. What a weird idea. Why would you do such a thing? That seems like two opposite things. Containers run on a host. Why do you boot them, Colin? So let's, let's talk about the problems, right? And some of you, I think maybe half of you were at Herman's talk yesterday, but not all of you will know, what, what are we talking about? Why, or why are we booting a container? So let's look at the problems. Uh, yeah, so the first one, the classic one is just, how do I manage Linux systems at scale? There is a ton of tools. There is a lot of history behind this problem. There's not one magic bullet to this problem. It continues to be a challenge, right? Again, going back to you, I'm that harried system administrator, which we can't train or educate enough of them fast enough to maintain all the computers that we keep making and our society depends on. And we, yeah, that's a, just this classic problem. Um, and then the other one that's strongly related to this is that problem and in infrastructure drift, right? You again have that systems administrator who got a requirement, you know, in the middle of the afternoon when they were, they were planning to go home and they needed to add a firewall rule for an app, right? And they did that, well, maybe they were harried, they did it outside of config management. They just SSH'd the server. Or they went interactively and just quickly did it with cockpit or something like that. They didn't put it in a repeatable manner and then that causes config drift, right? And then that causes a problem six months down the line. You're like, wait, why is this server in that state? There's a lot of solutions to this problem, but we're, we're attacking it in this. Um, the way, you, what, way we currently you know, install operating systems, you install a whole bunch of operating systems, and then instantaneously you install them for a second time. Right? You have some kind of tool that's going to go on and configure, um, set up you know, uh, different security mechanisms, uh, different security rules on the system. Um, so we're really doing sort of day one and day two in the same, at the same time. And then, you know, but why can't we unify those? Why can't we do those together? Um, if you're managing more than, say, 10 systems, uh, uh, you, you tend to invent some kind of image mode, right? You, you basically, a lot, a lot of companies go out and they create some kind of golden image, and then they flash it to hundreds of thousands of machines. Who here has invented an image mode? <laughs> yeah, that's quite okay. a few. Excellent. Yeah, and then typically there's completely different workflows between ops and dev people who build the systems, the VMs, and so on, and the people who put together the applications and deploy them. And, you know, they talk to each other, but they don't share a lot of the same common technology. There's definitely a way to include all sorts of different content, RPMs from PIP repos or other kinds of, you know, uh, language-specific content or configuration in containers, but for the host, you can do it, but it's completely non-standard. There's no standard way to package it up. So a really big one, this is, this is very close to my heart because I've been working on this problem for so many years, is just that problem of, I want to apply that OS update. Again, I'm that systems administrator, that CV comes out for the kernel or something in user space. I want to apply that update and have the confidence that I'm not taking serious downtime if something went wrong. Having rollback as a systems administrator feels like this immense, comfort blanket or something. Like it really changes the game. And, and that's a really big deal. And, and providing that 
is, is one of the things that we're aiming for here. Another one is like, as a systems administrator, I want to know that my system started and, may, and stays in a known state that like has a cryptographic signature that carries with it through the boot process into my runtime state. That gives you a lot of powerful, um, a lot of powerful features. Like, you know, for example, a, a classic security problem I like to look at is ransomware, right? And anything we can do to address that kind of thing, again, like if I'm Take my kid to the hospital, I want to discover that they got hit by a ransomware attack, right? So like, this is real. We need to make this stuff better. So OK, we talked about the problems. But why did we choose containers to address these, right? There's a bunch of technology solutions out there. There's a bunch of choices. Why do we choose? So there's one word that you can put in this sentence. I'm curious, anyone? Shout them out. Shout out your words. Hi. Our uh, ecosystem, correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, like this is a yeah. Let's let's go to the next slide. Actually, so I like to I like to think about things in terms of centers of gravity. Right, all of us every moment are pulled in different directions. Um, I think it's actually cool just thinking about the fact that the sun pulls on us a little bit right now. Yes, Earth is a giant center of gravity, but we're pulled in this. But taking it a little bit down, you know, we're all pulled between home and work life, right? Like, that's a classic one. But, you know, and you can look at this, the solar system analogy, you can look at, well, maybe Jupiter is Kubernetes, right? Saturn's maybe System D, or maybe Mars is System D. Like, there's all these centers of gravity, right? And the container ecosystem is large. There's so many tools that orbit that ecosystem, right? And so that's, that's why we chose that word, ecosystem centers of gravity. Uh, maybe another? Another center of gravity would be going to DevConf or getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch the Boston Celtics win the National <laughs> Basketball game. <Yeah. laughs> so we're on a mission together. And here's that mission. Let's read it out. To use standard container practices and tooling, such as the OCI standard, layering, container registry, signing, testing, and GitOps workflows to build Linux systems. This is that ecosystem. And using it to solve those problems is what so many people are rallying around and what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Steph, I took a course on slides, and you never read the slides. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, everyone could read. Um, so really, when we're talking about the container ecosystem, we start out with the container tools um, used to build these, these operating systems. Obviously, I'm you know, particular to Podman, but Docker, Kubernetes, and there's lots and lots of tools used in this environment. Um, so we want to basically build our operating systems using cloud-native technologies, right? It's all about taking advantage of these tools um, to build the operating system the same way we build our applications. We want to take advantage of container registries. Everybody has a container registry. If you're working with containers at all, you have a container registry. We want to use that for distributing our updates. We want to use that as the center, you know, again, the center of gravity for where you're going to get your content from. We want, with our container registries, we have the ability to sign images, sign, sign content, um, really take advantage of all the technologies that are coming out. And finally, we can scan. Right, so you can know what, the, what you have installed in your environment, and then you can use the image scanners to look for vulnerabilities. What, you know, all sorts of tools are built for scanning these applications. We want to be able to scan in our operating systems as well. So we want to build your operating system as a container using? Docker files. <laughs> no, no, no. We don't use that word around here. OK. A talk I gave a few years ago, we had a swear jar up here, and you'd have to put some money into it right now. So we're going to use the term container files, right? So when we're building our Im images, we're using container files, and we've built a, s a new kind of base image that includes a tool invented by Colin called Boot-C, bootable containers. Um, so one of the images we have, one of the base images, is actually Fedora Boot-C. Um, so you just pull from a Fedora Boot-C, there's CentOS Boot-C, RHEL Boot-C, um, and then you just install your packages, your RPMs, the standard way you always install them. Uh, you know, packages, but the really cool thing here is we're saying it's okay not to use RPMs, right? If you need to 
you know, use pip to install Python code. That's fine. If you need to just copy in code, if you need to run a make inside of a script, you can do all that stuff. You can also move your configuration files, right? So a lot of people, I install a machine, but then I have to get certificates onto it. Well, why not put that into boot at build time? You can run your Ansible. You can do sort of configuration, sort of that day two thing we were talking about earlier. You can do that in your container file during the build. Um, you know, config scripts. You can turn on FIPS mode. You can run your security uh, tools, things like that. So the whole center of gravity is around container files. And so it's worth. Oh, Hans? I hate container files. They're a terrible way to put things together. Oh, uh, Hans, well, you don't always have to use container files. And really, what we're looking at is building OCI images. So you could use Builder you know, with a bash script. So Builder has low level tools for building it. I mean, there's a whole project called BuildKit, which is all about using and building new tools for building container images. Yeah, I'm with you, Hans. You know, I like, think. The cool part about OCI is it's basically just tarballs wrapped with JSON. And if you add multi-arch, it's another level of JSON, right? Every problem in computer science can be solved with another level of interaction. And so any tool you use to build, to create these derived images, Bootsy's going to boot it. It doesn't have to be a container file. So once we have our container file, we basically use standard tools for building it. So you're going to use Podman build to build a container. And then once you've built your container, you know, containerized operating system, you want to run tests on it. So you use, what we were aiming at here is to fully test the operating system as a container. Make sure the system D is up. Make sure your service started up. You can go in and just run a standard container on the system, or you can run a full CI CD system. This is critical. We want to be able to test our operating system before we ever deploy. Run it through huge CI CD systems. Make sure uh, when you have an update that everything's going to work fine when it gets deployed into the systems. So just to add a little bit about that, another way I like to say this is like we're really pushing to shift left that config for your Linux system. Again, in that container file you saw earlier, a config file might be your firewall rule. Going back to that example, that system administrator, we hope you, instead of SHing that server, go in and in your GitOps pipeline, build a new container in a reliable way and run that through a server-side CI CD pipeline. Then you're finally going to deploy it. And you know, we're basically basing everything on container registry. So you're going to do a podman push to your container registry, update it. Um, you know, and we support all the container registries. But well, we don't really need to support them because the container rules already say that. The standards and the OCI, so you can use Quay, Artifactory, Docker IO, or any one of the cloud vendors' registries. Imagine you're a base system. You built, you're a company. You built a base operating system. So this is, you know, uh, name a big company. Someone shout out a name of a large company. <laughs> IBM. Okay, IBM, good example. So you, you, <laughs> so you create the IBM Bootsy, right? So IBM puts in standards for how they would want to do it. They create their own uh, customized operating system that's the base, and then they could layer on top of that. So everybody that wants to build individual applications for different types of services would just run, you know, basically do a from IBM Bootsy and basically run you know, the commands and stuff like that and build up um, extended versions of the system. And what would they do? they just do a podman build. It would run it through the test suites again uh, to make sure that the, the new version of the specific uh, platform is working correctly. And then they would push it to us. This is all boring. <laughs> I'm a Hans, we're not taking questions right now, but <laughs> this last time, uh, well, basically, you know, right now we're testing everything as containers, we're doing everything as containers, but we eventually want to get it onto the physical systems. All right, so, uh, let's see, loading, it's loading, ah, yep, there we go. Okay, so let me pause this. All right, so let me, yep. Okay, cool, I got paused. So just to explain the scenario a little bit, um, this is just a, a stock cloud VM, happens to be running Google Compute Engine. Let's use it because their console was better than AWS's for a long time. But it's basically just a stock cloud guest image. You know, this one uh, happens to be CentOS Stream 9. You know, DNF, cloud init. Again, no boot C yet, okay? We're starting from that thing. Because that's a thing that we shipped and we need to continue to maintain, right? That's actually an important point we haven't glossed over. We definitely don't expect the entire world to shift, right? Going back to centers of gravity, that whole flow still needs to be continued to maintain. So we're starting from that and going back in this. I'm just installing Podman because 
We don't ship Podman by default in that cloud image. Um, and I don't, hold on. Okay, so yeah, that was our start. Yeah, we're just installing Podman. And WC actually takes a good bit of latency here is compiling the SE Linux policy for container SE Linux. Because um, that, that thing happens to be dynamic. Who did right? that? <laughs> right. Okay, so let's go ahead and pause. Uh, I am failing to, oh, I'm sorry, I am not. I'm not seeing protein. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we? Yeah, okay. All right, cool. So what? Okay, let me try this and I'll just let it, I think I know how to pause now. I was doing this correctly before. All right, so what, this is from our docs, okay? So this is a, a fancy podman command, but notice that we're running it in privilege mode, okay? And, and you notice there's some special bind mounts here. Dan, do you wanna speak? Yeah, so what we're really doing here, if you notice there's a dash V of slash, we're actually mounting the entire operating system from the host into the container because we're running privilege mode eliminates all the security. And what we we're gonna do is we're gonna run a special command inside of the container. This is running the container that we just pushed to the registry. So we're running the container on the system and then we're gonna run this special command invented by Colin called bootc, bootable container. And what that's gonna do is, if you see at the end of the line, it says bootc install to existing disk. So we're gonna actually replace the system with the container. Yeah, so a goal of bootc that I have from the start, like if you think about a common question I kept getting is, well, what, is it, what does it mean to boot a container? Like, how does that work? And the thing is, I think it's a funny question, right? Because containers, again, are just tarballs, right? You ask, well, how did I boot my Linux system with a bunch of Debian packages or RPM packages, right? How does that work? Well, they're just file system trees, right? And then you just need to do some stuff to make that boot. But the interesting thing here is, the way people tend to treat you know, packages is kind of inert, mostly. Like, they, they come with their own scripts, but the container is a fully formed artifact that you can run directly. So part of the goal of Bootsy is to make the container an active agent in its own installation. Like when it goes to make the file system tree, that logic comes from the container, right? Containers are tarballs, but you need to boot a Linux system, you need a file system tree and a bootloader, but that stuff comes from the container itself. You didn't need to have something external to materialize and make it real. Like in some cases you do want an external installer, and we'll get to that. All right, can I success? Yes. Stop the video. All right, so this is again just comes from our docs. So what I'm deleting is just the variable that, um, at, you know, where it, and this is where you put in your container, right? And I put together a, uh, a Bootsy demo container. Just to flesh this out, that container image injects the Google Compute Engine uh, agent. And oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe I'll get, the, maybe, all right, go back. Yeah, so what you're seeing here, there's a warning, right? Because again, this is overriding, what's, right now it's overriding the bootloader state of that OS. It's not actually wiping the rootFS entirely because that would obviously break things. So just to demo here, there's actually now multiple file system trees, right? So I still have that root file system, but now I have a new root. Like the container installed itself into that root file system and set it up ready to boot. And so you can see, like, just as a demo, I injected a variant ID into Etsy OS release, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. So the container now set it itself up to boot. So I go ahead, and I reboot the system. It's going to kill my SSH connection. I re-SSH in. And now here's, here's a new command, right? Boot sees status. Like, yeah, we say containers are just tarballs wrapped with JSON, but, like, as that system's administrator, I want to know, did my system get this patch? Is my, what state is my system in? That's a cool part about containers because there's all these standards around them. I can say my system is described by this SHA digest, right? Like I know my, the state of the, this cloud instance happens to be exactly what went through my CI CD bit for bit and I can say, okay, it has this version, it has this SHA digest and boot C status is gonna show me that. It knows what is booted, right? We're not just untarring something. Um, and further, and further, uh, of course, the cool part is day two, your day two changes are, you don't, you don't have to run that podman command each time, your day two changes are, you just type bootsy upgrade interactively, it's gonna go out to the registry, look for a new image, and set it up for the next boot. So you get that like kind of transactional AB updates. And? So 
basically after I do the Podman build, Podman test, Podman push to a registry, we actually have set up on the operating system an automatic update. So basically on a daily basis, the system will go out to the registry and see if there's an update available and then we'll do the Bootsy upgrade. So we can get the humans out of the equation here and let the robots take over. Terrific. Yeah, I don't know how to operate this, so I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Let me just speak to this real quick. So I don't expect you to SSH in that server and run that Podman command, right? It's just a demo. It just demos well to like see what's going on. This is a what I did is just automate an example from the doc. So how you automate booting VMs? Well, there's a ton of that stuff, right? There's Terraform, Open Tofu. You might use Cluster API. I think it's cool. Maybe use CloudFormation, all that stuff. But the key bit, if you look at the bottom, is just like that example of you just automate on boot through cloud in it that that thing uh, that running that command. And so just think about like that cloud instance as like a giant init ramifest, right? You're just using it as a bootloader launcher. And uh, to kind of make this real, I did find a bug in the docs when I was putting this demo uh, yesterday. So uh, I did a PR to the docs, and you can do that too. So that's one mechanism to boot, though. But another way to do it is to actually convert it to a disk image. Uh, the Image Builder folks made a tool, Bootsy Image Builder, that lets you convert these um, container images to disk images. So the first time you use them, you can create an AMI, you can create even a raw disk image that you flash to something, of course, Hyper-V, VMDK, so on and so forth, QCows, all of those work. Um, and after, of course, you don't do this more than once after you just do the updates or the switches once you have Boot C on your system. Image Builder people here. Yeah. Whoa. Um, not only the Image Builder, but the Podman desktop team have uh, gone out and they basically have built in tooling into the desktop application that actually can convert your container image, your bootable container images directly into disk images. So. Not only do we have a nice command line interface, we even have a GUI for doing it. You can do this on your Mac and your Windows. You can create bootable images for Macs, VMware, all these other uh, infrastructures. So pretty much because of Bootsy Image Builder and tooling built around it from Podman Desktop, you can really take advantage of this. And Anaconda has support for this. It's had support for actually quite a while. You can take uh, stock ISO from Fedora, from RHEL, and add this line here to your kickstart, OS3 container. And you see there, we have a container image that's pushed to a registry. And it will install, just as you saw with the Bootsy install, it will end up on your system. Bootsy status will work. The system will re be represented by that same hash um, as you would expect. Does anyone know how old Anaconda is? Offhand? 50, yeah, it's actually 25 years, according to Wikipedia. Like, predates virtualization, right? And it's, we brought it forward all the way into this world. Uh, it has like, and it's, that's like the ecosystem, right? Where are the Anaconda folks? There, hey. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Should ask any Podman desktop people. Okay, right. great. Awesome. Cool. So, we just showed you a lot of different components here, right? Um, and the cool bit is, again, just to emphasize, we've put made day one and day two as similar as possible, right? There's a lot of ways to bootstrap in a system we just covered. But again, that idea is, once you've gone through that process of initializing or instantiating a system, your day two operations, ideally, it's GitHub. It doesn't always have to be, however you build containers. Um, but yeah, your day two changes uh, are done that way through a CI CD pipeline. So again, We've made a dent in this problem domain of managing Linux systems at scale. And infrastructure drift. Um, obviously, through the container file, we can actually do the day two. Yeah, we have to sing together. Uh, <laughs> you can do the day two operation inside of the container file. We showed that earlier. Um, also, what we're trying to do is instead of everybody having their own way of creating images, right? we want to unify the way you create disk images uh, and on the container images for the operating system the same way you create them for applications. You talk. Yeah, and the same tooling. Container ecosystem is used by dev for the applications and ops for the host. I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go.
You can also, in the same way, uh, the same theme continues with containers, uh, the same container file being used to bring config, RPMs, other dependencies from other sources, other repos, into one definition, in one package. And the other one, right, is we've definitely made sure when something goes wrong, and I do say when because it's software, right? It's infinitely flexible, but sometimes there will be regressions. When that failure happens, you have that confidence that you can roll back. Now, we haven't, turned, we haven't made up rollbacks automatic because when and how the policy for how you do that, there's a lot of nuance and choice in that, but that, that uh, command is there, the API is there. And if I really test my code out and test my operating system before I deploy it, then I really can have less chance of, of that. Yeah. And ChatGPT is going to take care of everything, right? It might be stuck in the animation. Okay, yep. All right, so one of the interesting things when people see this is they start thinking, oh, this is cool for my edge, you know, edge deployments. But really what we want to stress here is this is, you know, can you work in your data center? You know, anywhere you're going to have lots and lots of systems. Uh, we're going to have support inside of OpenShift, you know, Kubernetes environments, things like that. So, and then basically anywhere in the cloud that you want to run this. Um, so really we want to stress that anywhere you can run Linux, you be able to run image modes. You can install the systems and use image mode for managing your operating systems going forward. Yeah, so like it says on these shirts, obviously containers are Linux, right? Linux user space. But with this change, you start to get to the point where Linux is containers. You deploy it and build it in the same way. So, so who's running bootable container in this room here today? Anyone? Raise your hand. Shout out your name. Shout out your name. Pity. Okay, we're going to toss t-shirts from up here. This is our prizes. Neil and Mohan are going to give you t-shirts. So, one for Pity. One for Andre here. <laughs> Come on. All right. Who else? Who else is running it in the room today? In the room. Don't raise your hands unless you're doing it. Michael. <laughs> Give one to Robert, too. Oh, look, we have one here, Urashi. <laughs> All right, nice, Don't almost. Hit the camera. Yeah, no hitting the camera, okay? Anyone else? Say your name up there. Okay. Did you know that you, that right now in Fedora, those bootable, Base containers exist, you can take them. Um, those are the URLs down there. Take out your phones, take a picture, you get to documentation on how to do this. And go to the QR code. Um, CentOS stream layers also exist. You can start using this for your servers and systems today. Who has done that here? Who has a server running right now with one of these base layers? David, we're gonna throw a t-shirt at you. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Up there, say your name. Nathan. All right. If you want to run this on your laptop, one really cool way to do this is via Bluefin. These guys have taken this concept all the way. You should see their container file and all the tweaks that they make to make an actual focused workstation for developers doing modern day tasks that people have to do, all sorts of people. Some of them would, would surprise you. Some of the stuff in there would surprise you. And it's all defined in the container file. Built that way, deployed that way, updated that way. This is really cool. So deploy it, check it out. Anyone running Bluefin here today? Nathan, who else? Let's throw him a, yeah. <laughs> Nathan, can you raise your hand? So yeah, there we go. Oh, another one, another one there. Who else? Uh, oh, here. Daiki? So one thing I add, we're really hoping to collaborate with the Bluefin folks in the Fedora project and build together. Yeah, that'd be amazing. And I mean, that, that's cool. It's great to see how they're involved, participating. Um, of course, you can run this in production. 
Um, with OpenShift, nodes actually use today bootable containers to deploy the operating system. And if you want to customize what's on them, you add a line to a small Docker file, and it deploys to your systems. This has been in Contain production. Container file. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be a poor man by the end of this. Um, RHEL also has tech preview support for this since May, since 9.4, so you can try it out there. So one of the cool things about working in free and open source software right, is especially like you only sort of get a sense of the, your, uh, the tip of the iceberg of your user base by the issues or uh, PRs you get. And so we've seen a lot of interest in this, and it's, it's been really cool. But if you are part of that uh, bit that's, that's underwater and not telling us, we'd, we'd love to hear more from you. So where is this all happening? How do you get involved? How do you actually hack on it? Here's some tips. Obviously, you can hack on Bootsy. You can work on the images themselves, their definitions in Fedora, and the general ecosystem around that. Yeah, so the Systemd uh, group has been doing so much on this for many years around image-based Linux, and um, especially how you manage users and groups is, is a thorny problem in this, um, especially around UID allocation. And so if you can, move to either Systemd sys users or dynamic user equals yes, ideally, because that keeps the scope of a user for a service scope just to that boot. It's just better than kind of running user ad. In your this is when you're maintaining a project, packaging it, or building it. Use these features. Get your shit out of post um, yeah. in the RPM spec file. Yeah. Because so during an install, uh, during a container build, there's no running system. It's going to have different behavior. Yeah, we've discovered some... Some people flash their server firmware in the RPM percent post. That just can't work in this, needs to be fixed. Uh, I heard about a story yesterday about a company that ships source code in a spec and then runs make files in the spec in the post install and then basically does, that's all they do inside of their RPM. Not, <laughs> not good behavior. So we got the config file specification. Move your upstream projects to that. Keep, especially if you can put config files under slash user, that becomes immutable read-only state, which is what you want. But we support Etsy for a machine local state. Yep. And let's move on. Again, test your work in container builds, right? We want to test to make sure that your, 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 your actual commands run inside of a container file. So if you're you know, doing anything special to, on the system, that it can actually work in that environment. And now more packages are relevant in a container file than ever before. So this is where those need to be double-checked as well. We already talked about the, the, the config file specification. It's from this UAPI group um, where a bunch of people, I think it was founded by the systemd folks, are working together to define specs around immutable and image-based Linux. And the Podman team is working on a new, a new way of, of uh, shipping Code. Right now, everybody uses gzip uh, format for storing your tabballs and at OCI registries, but OCI also supports ZSDD. Um, uh, and we have a special version of that which uses ZSDD chunked, which will actually help speed up. But one of the biggest complaints in the container world is it takes so, you know, if you have large images, pulling them down. Well, if we move everybody to ZSDD chunked, uh, we can actually accelerate and really get uh, updates to happen much faster. And we're going to be pushing that into Fedora 41. And finally, big section uh, uh, is uh, tool that's coming along is Composer Fest. Yeah, I like to talk about centers of gravity, right? There's a big two orbits around files and file systems, right? Disk images versus container images, right? And Composer Fest helps us get the on-disk integrity of a disk image with the flexibility of file systems and containers. Yeah, so we want to move with Composer Fest. It will eventually become a tool that we can actually run a, a system that, you know, quote, quote, is immutable. Basically, we will know if the system has been hacked. We can know if, you know, certain things have become corrupt on your system. Uh, and we're working towards getting this into containers as well as into the base operating system. Yeah, so this is, this is all pretty exciting. It got me excited about the operating system again. Um, so many things, so many people and teams on this mission together. There's more talks about this. You can discuss it in the BOF as well, in room A112 on uh, today, later today. Um, check. The guy with the sign up here is about to give us the hook and get us off the stage, so that's it. That's, that's it. it. Who else wants a t-shirt? Who's running bootable containers? Let's toss them out. Go for it. 
All right.